I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 2 this morning. We continue in our series entitled, More, God Offers, We Pursue. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew rack right in front of you. Ephesians 2 is in the New Testament. It's one of the letters that Paul has written for us to grow in faith. Um, we're excited to work through this text, this writing for us, and to listen to see what God has for us today. Um, if you're just joining us for this series, this is the first time you've been here. This is the third of the messages from the book of Ephesians. And we're going to continue working through the book, listening for what God has for us. And we entitled the series, More, because of Paul's prayers there for us, that we would be filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better, to know him more, uh, and also that we might be filled with the power that God has given us, like the power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So two weeks ago, we talked about being adopted by God into his family. Being adopted, he chose us before the creation of time. That's amazing. That's more than we can understand it. Uh, but, but that means that there are privileges to us, a glorious inheritance that he's given to us to use and to live. Um, last week, we talked about the prayer that Paul prayed for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to give you insight uh, and to know God better. And we ended again last week by comparing the power of those who believe. It's available. Liken that to the power that Christ exerted in, uh, God exerted in Christ when he raised him from the tomb. Uh, so that's an incredible power that's available for us, an incredible power to live and, and follow Christ. This morning, our text points to a God who has been working in, in ways that are beyond what we might imagine. And I'm going to try to point out three ways for you this morning. But I want to begin with a quote from a book called Worship Matters. And the quote is on the screen. It's from C.J. Mahaney. And I'll let you read that as I read that, just so you can process this. When you tell non-Christians, God loves you, they aren't surprised. They aren't perplexed, and they aren't stunned. He says, regrettably, the same is true among most evangelicals, or most even churchgoers, who simply assume this gracious disposition of God, and therefore presume upon it. And we'll continue to do this until we learn to see our condition more fully from God's perspective. So in this message today, I hope to convey to you, just as Paul did for those believers in the first century, as a means of encouragement to you, that God worked in you in a mighty way to bring you from your sin nature to salvation. He provided salvation for you in a, many, in a mighty way through his grace in Jesus Christ on the cross and then also, the last point is that God is working in you today to transform you, make you in his likeness, and he wants his work to continue through you. So those three points. And because it's difficult in the text, the first of those three points may be difficult for us to walk through together. But I truly believe that the beauty of the gift of salvation is not fully understood until we understand the depths of our need for that salvation. So let's begin. Let's look at Ephesians 2. It's the first 10 verses. I want you to follow along, uh, and I'll preach from these then uh, this morning. We just ended with Paul saying that Christ has been raised from the dead. He's now elevated above all, and the power that we have uh, available to us is like him being raised from the dead. And he says to these people, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's the hard part. We're being described as objects of wrath because of our sin nature. He transitions with the word, but. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages 
he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that your text would come alive to us today, that it would be sharper than a double-edged sword, Lord, penetrating our heart and our mind to accomplish what you need to accomplish in us today. We pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The first point is this. God has worked mightily in the lives of believers to pull them away from their sin nature or to overcome our sin nature. Paul paints a very clear before and after picture in this text. He says very clearly, very bluntly, you, and he's talking to believers, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Hard words for us. Hard words for us and our culture. But it's the necessary understanding of this that leads to the correct perspective for our salvation and not to take granted the phrase, God loves you. The world today tends to believe that they are not so bad and consequently have no need for corrective measures in their life. Paul says the words, all of us, because it describes all of us. We once let sin nature dominate. The biblical teachings or doctrine of sin nature teaches that this nature was passed down to us because of the sin of one, because of the first Adam. In Romans 5, 12, it states, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. So we can thank Adam for our sin nature and our struggle with sin. Wretched <sighs> Adam. You might want to be mad at him, but this is the, this is the reality of it. Romans 3.23 echoes that. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. David understand that in Psalm 51.5. He laments, surely I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. If you tell the world God loves you, they won't be offended by that. But if you tell the world you're a wretched sinner, in need of salvation. That will affect them. It will. It'll catch their attention. This week over lunch, I watched uh, uh, an interview, um, and it described the conversation that Ron Washington, he was the, uh, the manager for the Texas Rangers, he resigned this week. I don't know if any of you caught this or not, but he resigned in a press conference, and in a press conference, he said these words, among others, he says, I was not true to my wife. After 42 years, I broke that trust. I'm here to own that mistake and to apologize to her and to those who have trusted me. I let them down. He confessed before millions what he did because of his sin nature. I wasn't so shocked or perplexed at the statement because in the world of professional sports in the last two weeks, there've been a lot of confessions of wrongdoing if you follow sports. I was perplexed, however, at the talk show, first take of ESPN, where two analysts then um, reacted to his confession of wrongdoing in a, in a way that thought, that's crazy. Why would he ever do that? Now, I'm not promoting uh, necessarily uh, public confession from everybody and the need to do that in front of everybody. Obviously, Ron felt that he needed to do that, and I pray for him. I pray that that, that his confession would help him and in relationship with his wife, perhaps they can be restored. But I was just amazed. And I think it was a good picture of culture where these two men reacted like that was absurd. Why did he even do that? Because culture doesn't want to hear about people saying I was wrong. I have sinned. Paul begins in this second chapter you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Some say that does not seem fair. I'm basically good. I do 
uh, I try to do what is right, and I don't do horrific things like rape and, and murder like the world does. And the error in this logic of thinking is that people that think this way are comparing themselves to other humans and not to God's standard. It seems that Paul wants these believers to remember how completely lost and helpless and broken they were before God worked to bring them into his family and to fill him with the Holy Spirit. Because the significance of our understanding this point, our sin nature, it ripples into our understanding of other doctrine, other teachings. One of them is your perception of God, and the other then is salvation, the necessary need of salvation. I have a couple quotes for you I want to put on the screen with you uh, for you to read with me. Millard Erickson writes in Christian Theology, if God is a very high, pure, and exacting being, meaning a thorough and demanding God, who expects all humans to be as he is, then the slightest deviation from his lofty standard is sin, and the human condition is very serious. That's taking a certain understanding of sin and sin nature. But people hold other thoughts of sin, or consequently then other thoughts of God. If, on the other hand, God is himself rather imperfect, or if he is uh, an indulgent, grandfatherly type of being, and perhaps a bit senile, so that he is unaware of much that is going on, then the human condition is not so serious. You understand? And these will affect our thoughts, then, of salvation. He continues to write, For if humanity is, you know, basically good, with intellectual and moral capabilities essentially intact, then any problems with respect to his or her standing before God, they will be relatively minor, not so serious. However, if humans are corrupt or rebellious and thus either unable or unwilling to do what is right, a more radical transformation of the person will be needed. So when I read you these words, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The second of those statements applies. We were radically helpless. We were radically wrong. We are radically separated from God. So we need supernatural to work in our lives. We need a salvation that is so great and powerful to rescue us from that. God has worked to pull us out of that through Jesus Christ. You know what? If sin nature pulls at us. It still pulls at us, even though we are regenerate, born again. It pulls at us to gratify the cravings and the desires and lusts that we have. We've all experienced this. You've experienced it. Um, children, you've experienced this when, when you don't want to listen to your parents. When you want to do what you think is right. We've experienced this with authority in our lives. What do they know? We've experienced this a lot of ways. We've experienced this even when we fight in our homes or with our neighbors. And the thing that rises up in the thing say, I'm right, I know it is, without even considering another perspective. It's just the sin nature in us that we need to overcome. It's the thing inside us which causes us to lust and to covet that which is forbidden. It's a thing that's within us that causes us to commit adultery or to live materialistically. I need this, I want this, and to ignore relationships in order to indulge in selfish gain. It's a significant moment in your coming to Christ to realize by the power of God working within you that you were born inherently in sin, selfish by nature, naturally given to pursue your own desires. Completely inadequate to stand before our creator and holy God. Paul says that we all lived there. We were all there. But he doesn't stop there. The exciting part of this, he says, in which you used to live. So praise be to God that he worked to provide a way for us to move away from this life of compulsion, to gratify the simple nature and be born again 
in Jesus Christ into a life that desires to be obedient to Jesus. But this work of God that's happening or has happened with us and I pray will happen with our youth and, and adults here that don't know Christ, it's not unopposed. Paul mentions two things in this text which are working against God in this. The first is the ways of the world. We used to live when we followed the ways of the world. They attempt to keep us from following God. The message of the world says that, you know, you're okay. You're basically good. Don't worry about standing before a holy God. The ways of the world will promote warped theology, such as universal salvation. All, all people, regardless of what they believe and think and act, will go to be with God. The ways of the world promote things such as equality of religions, suggesting many paths to God. It in, the ways of the world include New Age teaching, promoting that even you are God, and even atheistic views discounting the reality of God. All these ways of the world keep us from knowing and surrendering and realizing, I am helpless, I'm broken, I'm a sinner. The other opposer to God working in accomplishing this is described in this passage as the ruler of the kingdom of the air, or the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient. Paul identifies the spiritual reality of an opposing fork of the dark that continues to keep people from coming to Jesus from salvation. This spirit of the darkness also continues to attack those who have been adopted by God to pull them away from God. So this morning, I needed to walk you through that because I believe in some sense it's helpful for us to remember. Oh, I was broken. I used to be this way before God got his hands on me to do this work. Some of you, it's a dramatic transformation. Others that were raised up in the church, maybe not so dramatic. It's there, though. It needs to be there. You need to recognize it. I'm changed. I'm changed because of what God has done in me. Have you taken a good look at your life asking, am I still dead in my sins? Have I trusted in God's work to remove my sins from me and give me life? Is God calling me now to place my trust in him for salvation and true life? Paul then transitions us and them from that with the word but. He says, let me tell you about God, his character, and what he has done. So the second point of the message is that God has worked to make believers alive with Christ. This scripture reveals the character of God and his great power that he exerted for us and in us. God has worked to make us alive with Christ. God is working in these stages. I want you to hear that. It's God working. The first point of the message was hard to hear. It may have brought up some things that you would rather forget. We all have things that we would rather forget. I have them. You, I know you have them too, because we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory. Amen. You don't have to tell them all to me, not all in one day. If you need to feel that need to do that, that's okay. We'll sit down and we'll, share, and we'll thank God because he's chosen to separate us as far as the east is from the west from our sins. Thank you. Thank you, God. So when I say God loves you, I want you to remember where you were, and now he has made you alive in Christ. The good news of the gospel is never fully grasped until we understand how lost we were without God and that he worked hard to rescue us while we were still rebelling against him. Paul describes God in this text, in verse 4, God who is rich in mercy. Not adequate or proficient, but rich. His mercy is abundant so I want to walk you through that just a little bit to describe how he has done this for you already. The first point of the message is so significant to help us understand um, the need to call upon God's mercy in reminding us to remember. He's withheld the punishment that we deserve. That's what mercy is. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. You're five years late in your income taxes. We're going to just... Extend mercy to you and not make you pay them. Wipe them out. That really is not fair. 
See, see, God's not just merciful. He's also holy and just. He just can't wipe them out. They have to be paid for somehow. So in God's great mercy, he provided a substitute for your sins. Mercy. Mercy is you not getting the punishment that you deserve. You deserve it, you don't get it. Because it went to someone else. And the payment, the punishment for our sins went to Jesus Christ. God was at work to make this happen. And seeing the beginning from the end, God announced through Moses what he expected for our appropriate following of him. The Ten Commandments were communicated to reveal God's nature and to serve as a guide to make us aware of when we miss his standard. God has preserved his word for us to know the successes and failures of those who attempted to follow God and point out where he was merciful. David knew this God who was merciful. He cried out in Psalm 86, 3, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. He knew God as compassionate and slow to be angry. The, man out, the blind man outside of Jerusalem cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then to also help us understand his incredible insight and foresight and character, God used prophets to announce what he would do in the future for those that were in the living, in the moment, but also for us to look back and to know that God was at work throughout time in preparing this. One of the prophets that he used was Isaiah. And Isaiah prophesied these powerful words, which you've heard before. Isaiah proclaimed to God's people century before there was even crucifixion about Jesus' crucifixion. There would be one who would be pierced for their transgressions, crushed for their sins, our sins. The punishment that would bring us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Can you hear a merciful God in that, pulling it away from us, putting it on his son? We see God at work through this, he announced the provision of his son as the recipient for our punishment long before we breathed our first breath of life. And let me tell you why he did it. Because it says in the text, because of his great love for us. God has great love for you. That's why he did this. He loves you immensely. And I believe we all have a need to experience love and we respond to love. Um, mothers and fathers, you might have experienced this from your children. They've, they've handcrafted a card and glued stuff on it and really made a thorough mess, but you forgave that mess because they come up to you and say, I love you, mommy and daddy, and they gave you the card. They expressed love to you. You might have experienced that maybe from the church family as well, that you were lifted out of a, a troubling time because they just expressed love to you. Hugs cards, encouragement. A man that I knew in the congregation back home needed a kidney transplant in order to survive. Uh, he was dying without it. So a search was made. People were asked and tried to identify who could give this to him to give life. And here the donor actually then became his sister. She gave one of hers to help him live. It's a sacrifice, a great sacrifice of love. In the ultimate sacrifice of love, God in the flesh of man died for our sins. And God's motivation was love. Never forget that. God loved me. I know he loves me because he gave his son for me. God loves you. And in Hebrews 12, 2, it states that Jesus, he endured the cross. And that was horrible. We can't imagine it. We can't imagine scourging. The closest we can come to that is maybe a swat from our parents with a belt or something when we were little or a twitch. Nothing near it. He endured it, it says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him. And that joy is you and me and the relationship that we can have with him. He says, I'm going to do this for them because I love them so much. Never forget that. Never forget that. This undeserved love has a name. The name of this is grace. A gift given to you 
that you don't deserve is called grace. Grace is a powerful weapon that God has used to overcome darkness. When the powers of darkness rejoiced in killing the Son of God, they didn't see the whole picture. There was more. Grace won as Jesus was raised to life on the third day. Love wins over darkness. Sin and death have been defeated. God's grace is the tool by which all believers are saved. Our text says that twice. In verse 5, it says, It is by grace you have been saved. It's by grace you have been saved. It's not your works. It's not your church attendance. It's not your Sunday school attendance. It's you being worked on by God to receive this gift by opening up and saying, I need it. And God pours it into you. It says it again in Paul's signature verse, in verse 8, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved. He uses the words then, through faith. Through faith. What does that mean? Through faith is, faith is our response to that. Faith is our receiving it. Faith is our belief that, yes, Jesus did die and rise from the grave. Faith is our understanding, yes, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Peter and the other disciples, strengthening by the outpouring of the Spirit, rose during a celebration in Jerusalem to preach a message about what just happened. You know this scene. There were thousands of people there from all different lands, whatever. The Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in tongues. The people thought they were drunk. But no, Peter said this. We're not drunk, but we're here to tell you the truth. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and knowledge. God was working. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, we're a part of that because, you know, he died on the cross for our sins. Therefore, Peter says, be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They asked, how do we respond to this? So they, they understood they were wrong, their brokenness. They understood what he had done, and he's alive. And faith is then the response to that, is the receiving of the gift. He said, repent and be baptized. Initial faith is expressed by communicating your understanding of God's work and providing payment for your sins and the receiving of God's grace by, by saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Can you say that this morning? Jesus is Lord. And I accept his loving act to save me from my sin, guilt, and shame. The result of faith, as it grows and develops in you, understanding God's grace and his call in your life then, and you say Lord means master, if you, uh, then master is going to tell you to do some things. And then you will produce things called works because you're following the master. Some people think James and Paul aren't on the same page, but they are. James says faith without works is dead. So if you say you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's nothing in your life which gives evidence of that, James would say, are you sure? And Paul says, it's there. You're not saved by the works so that no one can boast, but faith should produce works. He continues, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Paul wants people to do works as well. So God's work has or can lift you from your life of selfish pursuits by revealing their emptiness and hopelessness, and his work has made you alive with Christ through grace expressed in faith. So we got our great need coupled and partnered with God's great gift, and it paints a beautiful picture of what he's doing. And that picture is you and me, alive in Christ. And the last point tells us that the picture is still being painted. God is doing his work in us. Paul realizes the bigger picture in God's plan that he calls sinners from their ways, opens their eyes to his amazing grace. He realizes that we who have been called have been crafted, shaped and formed into who we are by God's amazing power. I want you to consider this morning that God looks at you as a prized 
peace in his gallery of believers. We're walking into this museum and we're seeing believers from all the ages. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, you're a believer. You are, it says right here, you are his workmanship. God is working and crafting in you. So alongside the saints that we look back to in the Heroes Hall of Faith, beside Noah, beside Peter, beside these people, there's a section there for Bob. Bob is right here in the museum. And Robin. And Donna. Lester. Andy. You are his workmanship. And imagine God having a conversation with his angels looking upon this, those saved by grace. And the angels are wondering what this grace is all about. But they look, and, and God says, I just want to tell you about this one over here. I want to tell you about this one, this believer that, I, that has, I've worked in to reveal his sin nature and to, and to really understand what happened on the cross. And look at how open they are to my spirit working in them. He seeks me every day. And he allows me to teach him and move him and guide him in righteousness. Oh, look at what I'm painting through their life. You are God's workmanship. Consider Paul and the work God did in Paul. Paul underwent an amazing work of God to bring him from the place where he could accomplish the task that God has planned for him. Doesn't it blow your mind that maybe Paul ever grasps the reality that these letters that he was writing would influence millions across thousands of years? Staggering. Can you think perhaps that a decision that you might make this week might influence someone for Christ who then a hundred years later, if we live that long, might be doing other things and it all comes back to you? That's amazing. That's humbling. And it should make us alert. Paul was given life. God birthed him. He was to be the voice for the Gentiles. Paul was given a thorough understanding of the scriptures by being trained up in a school. God gave him zeal so that he would not quit even though he was beaten badly. God was working and developing him to do a mighty thing. But he had to open his eyes to see a true picture of Christ, of which he then confessed, I'm the worst sinner of them all. But then he guided and worked and shaped and sharpened Paul so he could accomplish the great work that God had for him. You're in that process. You should be. If you're not, God, I pray, is working on you and me as well. Do you recognize God working in you? Are you allowing him to have his hand shape you? Are you being like clay that he can mold? Is your heart softened or is it hard? This text says that he has prepared in advance good works for you to do. Our home in Bedford County had black walnut trees around the property. That's a black walnut tree, and those are the walnuts that grow on them, but that's not the one that was on my property. So don't think that that's my house. <laughs> and some of you have these trees around here, I'm, and some of your other servers told me, well, there's one at the end of the lane down here. I don't miss mowing them and shooting them and raking them and getting that black stuff all over our hands and all that, so, you know, they were kind of messy. And we had a couple of them, and, and we enjoyed the shade from them, though. They were really great. But Tracy and I also tried to plant a garden and grow vegetables. And every year, our tomatoes would come up, and they were looking great. And then all of a sudden, they just go, and they die. I'm like, what's going on? We're terrible at this gardening things. We came to learn that there was a, a, a natural herbicide exhibited from the roots of this tree, which can go up to 50 feet from the trunk, called juglone. And it prevents many plants from growing within their reach. Do you guys know that? Some of you did. Yeah, experience taught me that something was happening here. So we cut the trees down. We cut them down. And we had them uh, sawn into rough boards out of this. 
Uh, and we stored those boards, uh, which looked a lot like that, on, uh, on the trusses of our, of our garage um, to dry. Someone said, put some spacers in between them so air can get to them and they can dry. But you got to put them there for a long time. So we put them there and we just kind of forgot about them. The thing that prompted us to do something was being called here. What are we going to do with those boards that were up there? We knew that there were potential there. What are we going to do with those? So there's a guy in our congregation. I mean, he actually was here today, Mike Shawley. He's a tall guy. He was in your Sunday school. His wife, Stacy, was in the women's class over in the building, and they had two little kids running around. He has a nice workshop, uh, lots of tools, lots of wood-shaping tools. Um, so we said, Mike, can you make us a piece of furniture? We kind of gave him the dimensions that we thought would work and, and great, and so... We turned him over so he could work on them. He could be the workman on this. So he begins to do that very thing, planing them, cutting them down, shaping them. And he calls us over and says, I got something for you. And Tracy and I went over to the, to the shop and we walked in and we were like, oh, oh my goodness, look at what you did from this rough, unsmooth, splintery kind of lumber. You turned it into a beautiful table that's now here with us. And around this table, my family meets every day to have a meal or two. And we pray around this table. We play games around this table. And it reminds us of home. It reminds us of the relationships that we had there uh, and the beautiful people and Mike who made this for me. I'm so grateful. I think of Mike often because of this table. But it's also enabling us to meet new friends, make new relationships, potentially to have Bible studies with some of you, perhaps. You can see, and the analogy is that you are like one of these boards that God is polishing, shaping, forming, and crafting along with everyone else here and putting together to form a congregation, part of his church. And the purpose is then, as he shapes us, polishes us, puts us together, it will be used for his works and point other people to the craftsman who shaped it and formed it, produced it. God is at work in us and at me. If you knew me 20 years ago, you could say, you're right. He's done a work in you. Praise God for that. And I hope as we look forward, however many years, 5, 10, 15, 20, God's not done working in me or you. I hope that there is a tangible, recognizable change, shifting us more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. May it be the same for you and me and may we encourage each other to allow God to do his work in us. But it doesn't stop in us. We were created, we, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the beautiful thing is that different planks have different skills and different purposes that will make us powerful. Powerful in grace and in love. So I want you to remember this morning how God has worked to bring you away, away from death that you used to live in. And praise him for rescuing you. Rejoice that God has worked to offer his amazing grace at the tremendous cost of his only son. This grace is what has saved us. And what can save you if you have never received it? Don't resist the hand of the Almighty as he continues to build in you and use you to accomplish the good works that he has prepared for you. And my prayer is that the world may see the hand of God as they look at our lives. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for you are the master creator. You are the master who has given us life 
And Lord, for, for most here today, Lord, I believe that you have called them from a life of emptiness and worldly pursuits to have victory through Jesus Christ. We proclaim this morning that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And we thank him for being used by God to do an amazing thing for people on this earth. Lord, thank you for this time. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning, Lord. May they be open to your hand at work in them to make them stronger in ways in which they need to grow and to make them weaker, even dead, in things that you're trying to knock off of their life. For those here, Lord, tonight that, that, today that haven't received grace through faith, and they know that God is stirring within them the need to do so, Lord, I pray that they would, that they would uh, listen and allow you to work and to know that we will receive them, Lord, in the best way we can in your love and excitement. Thank you for this time. Continue to move and guide us through your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.